This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream in partnership with my streaming service, Nebula. On the 28th of February, the Ministry of Digital Transformation of Ukraine sent a letter to ICANN, the Global Authority for Internet Domains, to, among other things, cut Russia's .ru, .su, and .rf domains from the global web. A few days later, three of the world's biggest companies allowing internet traffic to flow in and out of the country one by one announced that they would drop their Russian clients too. At the same time, Russia has been decoupling its domestic networks from global ones since at least 2019 when it passed its so-called sovereign internet law and on the 6th of March the Kremlin claimed that its quote disconnection from the global internet would be complete just a few days later. Both Russian and international organizations seem to be moving towards a future where RUNET becomes more and more separate from the global internet so in this episode let's take a look at what an isolation like that would actually look like, how it compares to that of China and what it means for both Russians and the rest of the world. Russia's disconnection from the global internet is happening on five distinct levels. Domains, cross-border traffic, applications, cloud services, and content. Let's unpack these one by one, starting from the infrastructure level up starting with domains. Domains are essentially the address system of the internet. If data needs to go from one computer to another, it uses the domain name system to figure out how to reach it. The slightly simplified explanation of DNS is that an organization called ICANN manages a list of top-level domains like .com or .ru and hands out each of those to a so-called registry operator who allows others to create second-level domains like yandex.ru or mail.ru and keeps a registry of all of their servers and how to find them. If you want to find a computer on the internet, ICANN can tell you where the relevant registry operator is and they in fact can tell you where the website is that you actually want to get to. What the Ukrainian government requested was basically for ICANN to stop broadcasting to the world where the operators of the .ru, .su and .rf top level domains were, which should have led to computers not being able to find any sites whose addresses use these top level domains. Computers both inside and outside of Russia, by the way. That sounds like a devastating blow, but it's actually a pretty bad idea that thankfully didn't work. To begin with, while ICANN is a private American nonprofit organization that could have theoretically obeyed, it has intentionally made its system incredibly distributed. 11 of the 12 ICANN root servers are actually operated by other organizations, not ICANN, and there are about 1,500 instances worldwide mirroring these servers too. It's unclear how many of those would have actually refused such an unprecedented change, and of course the locations of the Russian registry operators is public information, so it's hardly information that they could hide anyway. And on the long term, ICANN really does not want to drop Russia. To begin with, because their whole reason for existence is to create and maintain one single standard address book for the entire internet, but also because Russia for a couple of years now has actually been looking for a way out of the ICANN system and blocking them would have really just accelerated that process. Russia started the unprecedented move of building its own competing DNS system a few years ago and it claims that it has succeeded already. And if they speak the truth, we could soon have two conflicting address books for the internet, with both storing potentially conflicting information that could lead to things like the same domain leading to two different servers depending on where you open them from. Utter chaos. Now nobody's ever successfully built and launched a competing DNS system before and a lot of experts that I found online were actually kind of doubtful about how far Russia has actually gotten, but this is something that they're actively working on and so pushing them down this road even further is the last thing that I can would actually want. Okay, the second threat area is cross-border traffic. Most internet traffic flows through something called autonomous systems. These are big networking nodes operated by internet service providers, universities, stock markets, or large corporations that end users typically connect to. Many of these systems connect to other autonomous systems outside of the country, which is how data flows between countries, and these systems provide real choke points. On the one hand, since 2019, Russia, under the guise of its sovereign internet law, has ordered all cross-border autonomous systems to implement controls that allow the government to shut down traffic at will, and the Kremlin has given itself the right to take control over
over any of these systems in case of an emergency. Russia claims that these controls have already been implemented and that they've run multiple successful tests with them, although again, many experts actually doubt how truthful those claims actually are, at least the extent of them. But the point is that they're essentially building kill switches into their network that can simply turn traffic going in and out of the country completely off. And on the other hand, foreign companies have claimed to have isolated key Russian systems as well. Cogent and Lumen, two market-leading backbone internet providers and some of Russia's biggest internet suppliers, said soon after the invasion started that they would cut Russian clients off, and the London Internet Exchange, the global leader in peering services that help autonomous systems negotiate traffic, has done the same. That's a big deal because the market is incredibly concentrated already, with Cogent, for example, having gobbled up 13 of their competitors over the years, and because switching to a new competitor would require physical infrastructure to be built in many cases. When these were first announced, a lot of analysts and journalists predicted that traffic flowing in and out of Russia would start getting congested real fast, but then in practice, not much has actually happened yet. Researchers at Thousand Eyes have looked at internet traffic flows and found that despite big statements, Cogent and Lumen seem to have resumed connectivity to Russian clients that have their autonomous systems outside of Russia like Ross Telecom, whose main cross-border systems are located in Germany, and whatever traffic was cut was picked up by competitors for now, meaning that traffic is generally still flowing mostly fine. I guess a lot of these network operators might act tough, but in reality don't actually want to incentivize a whole lot of countries, suddenly kicking them out of their suppliers lists. And similarly, Russia likely also has significantly fewer technical capabilities than it wants us to think it has, especially now with all the imports bands, so not much has happened yet, but these are real bottlenecks, they just haven't really been acted upon yet. Now the next form of isolation happens with blocking specific apps and websites across borders, and this is probably where the most action has happened so far. Russia has famously completely banned the most popular Western services in the country to block access to information that it can't control. The Kremlin first demonstrated the capability to throttle traffic to Twitter about a year before its invasion of Ukraine, and has since required all domestic internet service providers to run all of their traffic through so-called middle boxes, which are dedicated machines provided by the government that analyze and filter the traffic flowing through them in real time using a technology called deep packet inspection. Other governments like China and the US, as well as their internet service providers, have had the deep packet inspection capabilities for many years now, but it seems like Russia now has them too, and they've mostly been proven to be able to block certain sites with them. While some some services like Telegram have so far managed to find ways around them, and VPN services can present loopholes, which is why they have absolutely dominated mobile app stores since the start of the war. Long term, the Russian government could block or slow down VPN services as well, just like China does during sensitive events. In other words, the Russian government is becoming a lot like the Chinese one in the sense that it can simply switch off apps and websites at will if it doesn't like them. Okay, and the fourth level of threat is a vague collection of things that I'll just call cloud services. A modern website or app is kind of like a block of Legos, where the developer only really codes and operates what they have to themselves and relies on external stuff for almost everything else. Web hosting, geolocation, payment processing, analytics, even mundane things like fonts are often outsourced to external companies or cobbled together from open source libraries. And if enough of these are pulled from Russia, a ton of websites and apps would stop functioning completely. Unlike China's internet, which has existed in a sort of bubble from the start and has slowly built domestic versions of almost every foreign service, Russia has so far been relatively open and many services have relied heavily on Western inputs. The big three US cloud vendors, for example, had solid market share figures in Russia, and both they and a ton of other companies have limited their business with clients in Russia. While most of them aren't kicking existing customers off of their systems yet, they are a real worry, and there has even been a rogue developer of a popular open source package who has injected destructive code that would automatically delete data from projects with developers based in Russia and Belarus, which really highlights just how much exposure there is. The Kremlin has required that their government 
government websites drop all reliance on foreign services and packages for a few years now, and local equivalents like Yandex Cloud do exist for many services, but even they rely almost exclusively on servers from the likes of HP, Dell and IBM, CPUs from the likes of Intel and AMD, storage from the likes of Samsung, etc., all of which have actually stopped sales in the country, and there are just so many dependencies that a full pullout could be devastating. Now there are of course also some Chinese equivalents to the Western services, but a complete switch would be a lot of work, and so while Russia has made some progress, especially with the government websites, a complete pullout from the service providers would still be a massive blow. Okay, and the last level of this connection is the blocking and controlling of content within the platforms themselves. Here, Western platforms like YouTube and Facebook have decided to limit the reach of state-affiliated Russian channels like Russia Today, and Russia has made some big moves on their own as well. The country has long been the one submitting the most takedown requests to international platforms like Google, even before the war, to control information flow, and it has tightened its grip on domestic platforms a lot as well. Among other things, VK, the country's leading domestic social media platform was bizarrely bought by a subsidiary of Gazprom, the majority state-owned natural gas giant, after which its CEO promptly quit the company. And while Yandex, the sort of Google of Russia, resisted a complete buyout, the Kremlin has forced them to give up two board seats and a quote golden share, which gave the government control over the company, including the right to quote temporarily remove Yandex's management if needed. That leaves very little room for in subordination, and unsurprisingly, Yandex during the war suspended its news and infotainment businesses, likely to let the state control the narrative instead of them. And beside that, the government also passed laws making it punishable to speak of it and the war in ways it doesn't deem appropriate, meaning that news is heavily censored. Now, this is still nothing compared to China, where almost every online account has to be legally tied to a real personal identity, and the government can almost in real time filter and block every comment, every online transaction, basically every e-commerce purchase that users do, but that's basically the direction that Russia is heading into. In other words, Russia's connection to the global internet is threatened on multiple levels, from core internet infrastructure all the way to specific content filters, and both from its own government and external parties, and I'd actually argue that the worst is yet to come. On the one hand, most Western limitations, at least as far as the internet is concerned, weren't really the results of explicit government sanctions, but rather just random companies deciding that they wanted to get good PR, but they also didn't want to fundamentally break their business. But that can still change. And on the other hand, Russia has so far really only just claimed to have the capabilities for its most drastic measures, like its own DNS system or literally blocking all traffic at their borders, but it hasn't actually pulled the trigger on them yet, either because it was too afraid of unintended consequences or because it is likely overstating its real capabilities for now. Either way, both sides can still make things a lot worse. I cannot tell you how many analyst reports, studies, and legal documents I had to read to figure out the differences between what companies and governments claim that they can do and then what they actually do. I feel like the delta between fact and fiction has never been bigger. Disinformation is a huge part of this war like we've never seen before, and it's more important but also more difficult than ever to get the facts right and to find good analysis. Our platform Nebula is full of highly researched videos from trustworthy creators like my Nebula Plus video explaining how and why Russian cyber attacks on Ukraine have been pretty limited so far, or Real Life Lore's fantastic 30-minute breakdowns on previous Russian invasions of Chechnya and Georgia, or the Great War's brilliant analysis of the history of Ukrainian independence, etc. It is a fantastic way to stay up to date without having to second-guess everything that you hear, and because we the creators own the platform, it allows us to talk about sensitive topics that are often too risky to publish on YouTube, while also helping us finance big big research heavy videos so we can maintain our standards. If you are instead looking for lighter topics, I've also just released season 2 of Technorama on the platform, my Nebula original series where we pick apart science fiction tropes, and in this episode, we made an in-depth and super fun analysis about the fake promise of jetpacks. If you like sci-fi movies, I think you will really enjoy this one. Amazingly, the cheapest way to get Nebula is also the one that gives you free access to curiosity.
Curiosity Stream as well, so you get two services for just 15 bucks for an entire year. And Curiosity Stream is of course the best place to watch full documentaries online from legends like David Attenborough, Jane Goodall, Stephen Hawking, and more. As an avid scuba diver, I recently fell in love with their new show called The Coral Triangle, which is just fantastically produced as always. And beside nature documentaries, they also cover history, engineering, science, and a lot more. Get both services at the link in the description, and I'll see you in the next video.